My name is Sean Fry, Assistant Director of the Boone County Public Library, and join us for Episode 6 of Innovators and Creators. Josh Quinn, Co-Founder of Boone County Distilling. Sarah Barnes, Events and Marketing at Boone County Distilling. Okay, so the first, I guess, first question I have today then is, why bourbon? Why bourbon? Why, why, why do this? Why get, what, I guess, what's yeah. your, your drive behind this? What, what started it all? Oh, I don't know. I suppose, uh, I suppose a psychiatrist needs to help me out with that <laughs> one. We all need our heads examined. Um, no, seriously, why bourbon and how do we get into this? So it's a great story, and it's really, for me personally, it's, it, it's just a story of the American dream. You know, you're, you buy a lottery ticket to the American dream, and one day you just hope, hope that your numbers get called. So the way that it happens, it starts way back 2012 or 13. And actually, for me, it starts much further back than that. So when you're growing up, um, we were, we all taught, we're all taught lessons by people we know, by our parents and such. One such lesson is always tell people thank you, right? So we all grew up with manners. And tell people thank you. Be good to people. That's a fundamental lesson. It's just easy. Be good to people. Tell them thank you. So my business partner, Jack Wells, I met him in 1997, and he was a young entrepreneur in his early 30s, and he owned a bar called Jack Quinn's that was in Covington. Mm-hmm. And if you remember that, it was a beautiful yeah. Irish pub. Yeah. And then I was a young policeman, uh, which is what my career is for 23 years, but I was a young policeman, and believe it or not, I play the bagpipes. That's one of my, my hidden talents. So I was playing my bagpipes at the opening of Jack Quinn's Pub, <clears throat> excuse me, in Covington, and uh, you know I saw a guy wearing a Jack Quinn's coat, and he were they were being great to us. They were buying food and drinks for people, um, and I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I thought he was the manager of the place. I introduced myself. I said my name's Josh Quinn, and I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. And uh, are you the manager? And he said, No, actually, I'm the owner. And the dialogue continued from there, where uh, he, he had told me that he lived in Boone County, Kentucky. And I said, well, I live in Boone County, Kentucky. And we talked about where each other lived. And he asked me what I did for a living. And I said, well, I'm a, uh, back then, the Boone County police existed. I said, I'm a Boone County policeman. And he said, oh, I used to run in the life squad a long time ago. Um, and he's in the coal business today. He said, can I ride along in your police car with you? Sure. So on Friday and Saturday nights for a couple of years, I'd pick him up at his house and we would drive around the county and get involved in whatever happens in Boone County, you know, between 4 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. And uh, we had a lot of fun, but we stayed friends all these years. So fast forward to 2012. 2012, my business partner, Jack Wells, had done very well in the coal business, in the international coal business. And we're in his basement and, you know, like the guys do, we would enjoy uh, drinking whiskey. I was a bourbon drinker, and believe it or not, he was a Canadian whiskey drinker. And we would read the back of bottles, and we would talk about, you know, just any bottle you can find. And, you know, we all talk about marketing magic. We talked about what we liked, what we didn't, what stories were true, what stories weren't true. And and believe it or not, an episode of Moonshiners comes on, like a (laughs) commercial. And the bourbon bourbon boom was happening at the moment. Right, right. Okay? And my business partner, Jack, had said... um, he was looking to get involved in something else. That's what serial entrepreneurs do. They, they're risk takers. They want to get in on the next big thing. And before we even had the history of the old Boone Canada distillery, he sees this episode of Moonshiners, and, you know, I can't do him justice sitting here. He would have to be here, and you have to live in the moment to get how he says this. She, Sarah's heard us a lot of times. But to know my business partner, Jack Wells, he looks up at it, and he says, let's build a whiskey distillery. How hard can it be? You know, and I thought, I think he's been drinking too much. And I didn't pay any attention. You know, I'm a patient. I'm an investigator. You know, I'm a guy who, who you know, I'm a very analytical person. Um, entrepreneurs are not. They're cowboys. That's yeah. what they are. They're risk takers. That's not me. So he said it, and I was like, ah, he's, yeah. he's, he's, Just uh, talk. he's talking, you know, whatever. So about a day later, he calls me, and he says, where are we at on the distillery project? And I looked, and I thought, Man, he's still drinking. You know, this, <laughs> I, stop. I didn't think we had that much to drink. I thought we were just sipping in whiskey, you know. So about two weeks later, and I told him, I said, I'm working on it. And I yeah. just kind of blew him off, really. So then about two weeks later, he calls me and he says, hey, where are we at on the distillery project? You know, and I gave him a time out. I right. said, hey, time out. We have to have a serious moment. Are, are, are you serious about this or not? And he was calm and he said, yeah, let's, it doesn't cost anything to ask questions. Let's just explore it and go from there. So we did. And uh, 
we, we just, you know, that, that's what we do. Um, we ask questions, and asking questions didn't cost any money. And we were eventually led to Vendome Brass and Copper Works down in Louisville, which is uh, Rob Sherman, the president down there, treated me like gold. Um, he gave me a list of, uh, you know, and when you're a policeman in Northern Kentucky and you tell him you want to build a, dis- a distillery, right, right. and there's all these people, man, that, I mean, really, you know, they make stills for Jim Beam, Wild Turkey, Maker's Mark, and here I am, Josh Quinn, uh, you know, a Boone County law enforcement guy um, clearly doesn't have any money to do this. Right, right. And, but they treated me like gold. They did not treat me um, like that. They were yeah. great. They gave me a list of consultants in no particular order. They weren't in alphabetical order or ranked by the way they liked them or anything. And I just happened to pick the one that had a 513 area code on his mobile number because I figured he lived around northern Kentucky with 513. Yeah. yeah. So I called him. And his name's Larry Ebersold, and he lives in the Hebron area. Um, and Larry worked at Seagram's for 38 years, uh, he, the old Seagram's distillery, and he was the plant manager for 20 years. Now, the term master distiller comes up a lot. You know, they ask who our master distiller is. Larry Ebersold is a chemical engineer from the University of Louisville way back in the day. You can call him a master distiller, but he'll tell you he's a chemical engineer. Mm-hmm. That's what his background is, and master distiller is just marketing jargon that people right, right. use. So that was that's part of the why, and then a little quicker of an answer to the second part of why we got in the bourbon. It's about Boone County. It's really that easy. You know, when when you, when you want to build a distillery, uh, besides the build out in, 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 in going into a business, which neither one of us had any, any knowledge of or background, you know, that's, that's difficult in itself. The second piece is you have an identity crisis. Who do you want to be? Right. You know, right. it's an identity crisis. Who are we? So you start looking things up on the internet like we all do. We go to Google. We start typing things in. And I think one of the search terms we used was Boone County bourbon. Petersburg mm-hmm. bourbon. And there it was. Petersburg and bourbon, and it popped up. Mm-hmm. So there was a paper uh, written by Matt Becker, the Boone County Historical Society, who currently works uh, for Boone County government. Um, I think Matt is in, in, is in planning and zoning or rural space development or something. I can't remember which department he works for, but I know he still works for the county. So he wrote a paper back in 2002. It's an 18-page white paper. Uh, you can find it on the Internet today. Um, a lot of references to the Boone County Public Library in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's called the Petersburg Distillery Snyder's Old Rye Whiskey. And it's actually a quite boring read. If you're not <laughs> looking to build a distillery, you're not going to... It's not going to inspire you. you know, if you pick gonna, it up, it's not going to make a difference. No, right, and, right. And, and so you read about this wonderful history of Petersburg, Kentucky. And as, as we all know, sitting here, Petersburg, and, and for your viewers that might not know this, but the listeners, but Petersburg, Kentucky, from 1833 to 1899, really had had one heck of a history with the distilling business. And it's, it's, you know, I've lived and worked in Boone County a long time. I've had a whole career here, in, in, as of probably most of us have. And when you ask people in the community about the distillery in Petersburg, nobody ever heard of it. Mm-hmm. But if you go to the Petersburg Cemetery a little west of town, you're going to find all the names of the great distiller. You're going to find the Snyder name, the Loader name, uh, Colonel William Appleton. You're going to find all these great names from our history, and they're buried there. Uh, the house that's up on the, the hill called Prospect Farm, the, I think it's still the only uh, home in Boone County that's on the National Register of Historic Places um, that J.C. Jenkins built, probably around 1874-ish, still sits up there today. You know, be- gorgeous. gorgeous, beautiful piece of history, or even Split Rock comes up, mm-hmm. right? Split Rock, uh, natural geological formation on the banks of the Ohio River. Um, it's privately owned today, but uh, Split Rock comes up in the history. So lots and lots of great things. And once we figured out that there was a distillery in, in, in Sarah, what year was it the largest, the, the most productive in Boone County? Uh, four million gallons of whiskey a year. I think it was right at 1897. Yeah. Right before 1900, I guess. So it, it, the Petersburg Distillery made more whiskey than any other distillery. All the distilleries combined in Kentucky at a, at a certain period. Who would have known that? Right. And in 1899, the old place folded and... Um, And then Petersburg really hasn't done anything since. As we all know, there's not a whole lot going on in Petersburg. So part of what we're doing is we want to bring back some of that rich history. That's the other piece of the why. So you can hear by me talking, you know, Mm -hmm. I have a passion for Boone County. I have a passion for the history. I have a passion for the people of Boone County, um, to retelling this great story. And then above and beyond all else, we have a passion and desire to make not just great whiskey, but we want to make world-class whiskey. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's the why. So... 
so you started off, I mean, kind of, oh, you're serious. And then, and then the next thing was you, your first call was to, um, I, I'm, I don't mean to simplify it, but a vendor in Louisville? Yeah, Vendome is what, Vendome Brass and But I mean, and they're a vendor yes. of, yes. Um, and, so, yes. and so they are, explain, explain what they do, because it sounds like they became pretty important pretty fast as far as providing information and, and, and contacts and, and moving mm-hmm. forward. Uh, Vendome Brass and Copper Works, very simply put, they are the uh, North America's largest still maker. So anytime you visit the Kentucky Bourbon Trail and you see these beautiful column stills, you know, they're 60 feet tall. Uh, A good example of northern Kentucky stills, uh, our pot still that's uh, just behind us here is a 500-gallon copper pot still. It's beautiful craftsmanship. Um, If your viewers and listeners were to travel to Newport or Bellevue to see the new Rift Distilling uh, uh, business, you would see their 60-foot column still or the old Pogue Distillery that's down in Maysville, you'd see them with a 60-foot column still also. So they're world-class still makers, and they make it for all the big guys, you know, Mm -hmm. whether you're Jim Beam, Wild Turkey, Maker's Mark, uh, they've all got them. And I would say today, if you're using anything less than a Vendome, it's the equivalent of someone who, uh, they, don't, they don't like pork bacon, they like turkey bacon. <laughs> so this is the one. This is the one. And then, so then you were put in touch with a, a consultant who really obviously knew from his chemical engineering background and, and 38 years experience. And then it started kind of gaining momentum then. So at, at this point, you've, you've got some knowledge and you obviously have a, a passion for the county, a passion for everything. I guess at, at, where was the next step then? Where you kind of got the ball rolling, then where did you all go? So you, you got the knowledge, you got, got the fire, but... What, what was next? So I, so what happens after you decide you, you want to build a distillery and you make a commitment that it's a good idea, we found a story, and we have an identity? So what happens next? Well, it's a multi-pronged approach. So in the whiskey business, one of the hard realities of getting into this is that you have to wait six years for the whiskey to be ready, at least six years. From the time it's an idea in somebody's basement – from the time you're selling the whiskey that you've made that turns into bourbon later after it's aged in the barrel, it took us about two years to build this place out uh, before we made our first drop of, of whiskey. And then once we put it in the barrel, it's been sitting there for three years now. We still have at least another year to go. So it's going to be six years, really, before you start really having too much cash flow. Mm-hmm. And that's a tough thing. You know, this business, it's capital intensive. It takes a lot, a lot of money. Um, as opposed to if you're making beer, mm-hmm. right? We all know lots of people, lots of places, the great craft breweries in the area. But once they build out, they can start cranking out beer a couple of weeks after they start making it. Not this. Mm-hmm. You've got to wait four, five, six years, and, 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 it's, and it's a whole lot more expensive. You know, a, a six-pack of craft beer is 10 or $11.00. You know, 750 milliliters or a bottle of, of what we knew was just a, a normal bottle of bourbon, um, you know, is upwards of $45, and the prices keep going up these days. I mean, you, the price, the sky's the limit on that. And it's a whole lot harder for common people like all of us here. $45 is a big risk. You know, we don't have $45 to spend on bourbon. It's a whole lot easier to go spend 10 or $11 on a six-pack of beer. So, that, and that's another struggle. But uh, that was the next thing, um, was deciding to locate a piece of property in Boone County. Mm-hmm. We could have went outside of Boone County, but we knew from day one, and for me to be involved in it, and my business partner, Jack Wells, he lives in Boone County, it had to be in Boone County. So the next step was to locate a place in Boone County, and then the second part to that is locating barrels of whiskey to sell. Because if your whiskey's not going to be ready for four to six years, what are you going to sell people? Mm-hmm. So all the whiskey that you see on the shelves behind me, that's called sourced, uh, sourced product. That came, we were very fortunate, and we came across 500 barrels of bourbon from the old Seagram's Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, just really right across from Petersburg, across the river. And uh, we, we were fortunate we purchased those. Um, they're not, so when we bought those, they were $1,400 a barrel, right? It doesn't mean too much to any listeners out there to us. But uh, today, those barrels... If you were to sell them wholesale on the market, they would be six thousand dollars a barrel. That kind of tells you where the market's gone. Um, yeah, so that's how we. That's that was the next step. So it's a it's a big wait. Playing the long game, you're able to be patient, and then and then put together. So it was important to stay in Boone, you, and you went through that process of finding a location, mm-hmm. um, which is, uh, I'd say, lovely. I don't have a lot of stories to compare it to, but I, it's really nice, really nice place. Yeah. Um, at that point, then I guess how how important in this kind of where the community events of creating that space. You know, you, it's, it's one thing to be really good at the, the whiskey part of it, but now you've created a space that people want to visit. Mm-hmm. And how'd you go about that? Like, where was, 
how'd this, sure. how'd this all come in? Sure. So the facility that we're sitting in, uh, in the Boone Canada Distilling Company, we're located, to give folks a geographic reference of where we're at, um, I-75 at the Mount Zion Road exit, exit 178. And when you get off the Mount Zion Road exit, you want to go east towards Kenton County. You want to cross over Dixie Highway, and there's Tobin Drive. Tobin Drive is an industrial park. And in Boone County, for planning and zoning purposes, this is known as industrial two-zone property. Not many folks would know that. So what does industrial two-zone property mean? If you're distilling alcohol, this is the only place you can do it in Boone County. Okay. All right? Um, because it's high hazard, essentially. And we don't have any... Uh, 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 residences, uh, residential uh, places near us. And, and that's a great thing because some people around here, they make paint, you know, we make whiskey, and unfortunately they're high hazard. And if something goes horrendously wrong, there's no, there's no uh, uh, homes that are affected by it. And these businesses are so far away from each other and all have high hazard safety protocols in place that uh, we're, we're, everybody's well prepared for something like that. Um, so how did it get built out? Bill Tobin, um, uh, of Tobin Company. It's a very well-known name in, in the area. This was his property. It's the Tobin Industrial Business Park. Uh, we bought the property from Bill Tobin, and as a part of that contract was uh, Bill Tobin got to uh, build the facility. So there's three pieces to the facility. There's the Rick House where we store the barrels, there's the distillery, and there's the gift shop. So three separate things. Mm -hmm. And the distillery, uh, when we built it out, was about 3,300 square feet, no, you know, 800 barrels, maybe seven or eight, 800 barrels it holds. <clears throat> That's a state high hazard building. So that is a, uh, one of the, one of the few places we can have this in the County or even mm -hmm. it, it's a state high hazard building. Um, the distillery, um, the distillery operation that was put together by Larry Ebersold, the consultant, it's really his design. Uh, we had Vitoc engineers out of Louisville. They're distilling engineers that were out here and a whole host of other people. It's a little factory is what it is. You're making whiskey. It's high hazard. There's a lot of things that we don't have expertise in that we had to hire people to do. And the last thing that we did is the beautiful space that we're sitting in now at the Boone County Distilling Gift Shop and Tasting Room. Um, this particular room that we're sitting in, uh, it came down to the last day when Bill Tobin, the builder, came to Jack Wells and I and said, guys, you have to make a decision on what we're doing with the gift shop. And we personally, we really, we didn't have time to think about it. We were so busy trying to make things safe mm -hmm. in the distillery, in the Rick House, and worry about how we're going to make whiskey. We weren't worried about the gift shop just yet. We weren't worried about tours or anything. And we had two people come in, bids. Uh, one, one organization came in, and they wanted this to have an industrial look to it, mm -hmm. which wasn't the right, the right uh, feel for us. And then Joy Perkins came in. She's a, another Boone County person. Joy Perkins came in. And she looked at the space. She, co she connected with Jack Wells and I very quickly. And she knew, bam, man, she knew exactly what we were going for. We were going for something, Petersburg, Kentucky, 1850s, 1870s. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look around here, you feel like you're back in, you know, mm -hmm. we, we tried to recreate something from the 1800s, uh, whether it's from the stonework or we have some, some archways with stone. We have big, nice copper lighting, um, you know, nice planks of cedar wood. I mean, it just feels like you're in an old place. And our goal was to make you forget that you were an industrial park. Right. And I think that was part of the goal. You did a great job on that. Okay, so I guess to kind of ask you a question, get you involved in this, is this so, um, just chatting briefly, you're, you're telling me about the, and I, I'm using this sarcastically, the annoyance of success that you're having <laughs> and all the great things that are going on. Because a lot's going on and how you're, you still have to reimagine and kind of redo the space to accommodate. Absolutely. <laughs> as you're accommodating. Um, so maybe kind of a little bit of, of sure. kind of going through your life, just like we had so many people coming in and then, <laughs> and then you mentioned all of a sudden there's a sign on I-75 and, you, you know, if you, if you build it, they will come. That's right. And, we and they did. You know, cart before the horse kind of a thing. Um, so our big brown sign got approved and went up on the interstate at the beginning of the summer. Um, that has been significant for us. Obviously, people that lived in Boone County were right off Mount Zion Road, had no idea we mm -hmm. were even tucked back here, and they've lived here for years. So um, outside of putting big flashing lights on a sign out there, we um, now have an exact, you know, location everyone that passes that really busy interstate every day sees it. So they know where we are. They now know we're here, even if they think we haven't been here three years, we're kind of a new right. thing. Um, 
And that's wonderful. You know, it's exactly what we wanted. We wanted people to come here. We wanted them to learn about the history, appreciate it for sure. Um, the other kind of growing part of that is on a busy Saturday with not very many employees in the small kind of tucked back space we're used to, we could have upwards of 200 people come through here. So we've kind of had some growing pains this summer. We had a temporary structural tent put out to kind of ease some of the tasting room out of the gift shop just to make the flow of traffic a little bit better. Um, and that's really helped. You know, we at some point in the near future after the Rick House expansion, because obviously the barrels have to have somewhere to go first. Um, we're hoping to expand the visitor experience. So there will be, you know, a larger gift shop with a proper tasting room kind of offset out of it, um, and then possibly some form of an event center. Um, I get emails every day for weddings and receptions, you know, office Christmas parties, over 50 people. Mm -hmm. And right now we can accommodate about 30 to 32, um, kind of for a cocktail reception, more intimate setting. So there's definitely a need for it, um, but all good problems to have. It's right. Right. just a matter of controlling them right so um and so and this is very <laughs> just scattered maybe you guys can pick up where i ask these wide questions I, do you find that obviously i feel like the overall kentucky's done a really good job of letting you pe people know that bourbon is, is in kentucky and it comes from here and this but um how how is it to connect with the other distillers throughout the state you know as, as, as like one community i mean i know people will take the tour and they you know they come from hundreds of miles you know, overseas to visit and to do that. How, how is that? How is that able to, to connect and bring in people and how this experience is maybe a little bit different than the other things you'd see on the tour? Sure. Um, so we are members of the Kentucky Distillers Association, as are a lot of other distilleries. Um, so that's kind of really given us a good foundation as far as, you know, what our tour experience should be, kind of guidelines as far as what, what to expect when you come, kind of a standard. Um, we joined the Kentucky Bourbon um, Trail Craft Tour about two years ago. So there's a passport with 14 other distilleries. So when you go to them, you know, you will learn that bourbon is 51% corn at least, you know, it's got to be in a new white American oak barrel, um, all kind of the basics, but you also get a little bit of their personalities with every tour. So either a family history or, you know, the, the county's history that we have, the stories that we tell for each of our products, each one of the guys that came before us. So our, our ghosts that we refer mm -hmm. to. Um, so I think there's just a little bit of uniqueness in every single one of them. So when you're in Northern Kentucky, you can hit us, you can then go on to New Riff, which mm -hmm. obviously is a new riff on an old tradition, so they're a little more shiny and new and mm -hmm. a little bit larger for sure. Um, and then if you make your way out to Maysville, which is a beautiful drive, there's Old Pogue, um, and the history and the roots and the family there is really interesting. So um, another big thing for us in Northern Kentucky has been the Beeline. We are all members of that. You know, we all are Stave and Thief certified. We, you know, kind of have that that standard and those core values that that we think are a part of every tour. A lot of in-state travel happens, but we also get a lot of people out of state that, right. you know, love the product, but they're not engulfed in it like we are in Kentucky. So, well, and it sounds like you're kind of just between the two other examples you gave between uh, uh, Maysville and, and Bellevue. You're kind of the hybrid right, where you have a historical background, but then you're also kind of brand new. I yeah. mean, you're, you know, you're kind of you're kind of touching into yeah, that. Yeah, I think and, we all give give a perfect example of something different. I mean, right. you can go to the three and not be like, oh, it's the same exact thing every time, you know? Well, and it's, and obviously I'm going to tell you stuff you already know. I mean, the people who are into it are really into it. They're very passionate. And so it's, I think it is kind of interesting that you can kind of give them that spin of what they probably already know. I mean, they're probably experts to some extent on this and you're oh, like, yeah, this is how we do it. Though. Yeah, this their is... favorite thing, like when our tour guides give tours, their favorite thing is to try and stomp one of our tour guides. <laughs> I mean, they absolutely love it because, you know, it's like I do the same thing. I know everything. It's totally fine. So I think that's a big part of it. You know, my tour guides kind of read the group and know like, okay, they've gotten mm -hmm. the bourbon history over and over again. So it, there's no need for that. But let's right. dive into the science of it or things like that. So I think it's it's really been helpful for tours when, they, you know, my tour guides know kind of how to how to judge the room. So. Right, right. When is, I guess, your, your busy season? For, for, I'm obviously just referring to the gift shop area and the tours and the, and the coming through. Is this kind of it, or you've got an event coming up? Summertime, summertime for sure. Um, Bourbon Heritage Month was in September, so it's usually a busy kind of right after kids go back to school. Some right. places, some people do travel then, um, a lot of in-state travel. And then we do a fall festival the end of October, which is kind of our closeout of the summer, our last kind of hurrah before either the snow hits or the bad weather hits, one of the two. Now, is that is that... 
I don't mean to say typical as a negative, but is that like typical La Distillers do a kind of a festival or is that kind of your unique kind of spin so on it? So a lot of different places do a lot during September. There's, you know, the Kentucky Bourbon Affair, which goes on during the week. There's, um, you know, bourbon all-star things. Everybody kind of does their thing right. towards the end of the season. Um, this is our third year for doing our fall festival. We partner with Rheingeist. They come over the river and bring okay. beer for the crowd that, you know, we know not everybody likes brown liquor, and that's fine. <laughs> um, we do live music. I've got craft vendors. We have five or six food trucks that come out. Um, and so we just kind of, you know, block off the parking lot. Everybody hangs out. You do music and fellowship and bourbon and, you know, kind it's, of it's have an that, afternoon. It's creating that community. Exactly. It's, and embracing it, too. Is where exactly. They, they want... And the weather's generally pretty good. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. They, 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 like, want you. They probably feel an ownership, probably, to some certain, mm-hmm. you know, this is their yeah, this and I mean, people, place. I when we finished our fall festival last year, it was like, okay, when's spring? And I'm like, I need just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, like, it was really fun, but it was not as many, you know, we had over 3,000 people out here last year, which, that's, you know, just blew amazing. our minds, yeah. so we're super grateful for it. No good deed goes unpunished. That's right. <laughs> when you do, when you I can do. throw a good party. <laughs> I'll bring the drinks. <laughs> I will. I will have it already. That's set. right. <laughs> I'll have it already said that. Okay. So I guess jumping around, the one thing that I, you know, you all gave me a very quick uh, tour, and which is perfect. Um, I, I think I'm getting smarter I'm trying. <laughs> um, the one thing that strikes me is that the history and just looking at that, at kind of the founders and and stuff like that. So, so I guess kind of going back and researching, um, what did you kind of learn about the history of? Uh, and by the way, just a very simple question: Was it called? Boone County Distillery, uh, Distilling? The was oldest, it? The yeah, oldest, was that the name of it? Yes, to answer that question, the history. So the old distillery in Petersburg, it was called the Petersburg Distillery. Okay. Also known as the Boone County Distillery, so it went by both names. Okay. Right? And what did we learn about the history? I mean, look, you know, there, if you go to Louisville, Bardstown, you're going to run into the, the, the bourbon giants of not just Kentucky or the United States, the whole world. Mm-hmm. And they control the history, right? I mean, they have the marketing dollars. They control the history. And most of the bourbon trail is located down on that I-64 corridor. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the proudest thing that I've been with this is that for Northern Kentucky, really has no had no bourbon presence a few years ago right and when new riff came on the scene and we came on the scene old pogas had a presence but you know with all of us coming together you know they say that a, that a rising tide raises all ships right. well that's happened and there is a great distilling history in northern kentucky and it has to do really with the ohio river so if you're maysville and you're on the ohio river well when they sold whiskey those boats would float downstream which means they would go from maysville towards Cincinnati, towards Louisville, to the Mississippi, and all the way down to New Orleans. So it's, it's just kind of natural there was a distillery in Petersburg. Uh, but what have I learned from it? A couple of quick names. Um, Lewis Loader. Lewis Loader kept a diary from 1857 to 1904. And if I'm not mistaken, his original seven leather-bound diaries are still uh, in Petersburg at mm-hmm. the Boone County Public Library. Mm-hmm. It's privately owned, but on loan to the library. Am I right about that? Yeah. So, and they were retyped, and they are back on the internet. Uh, somebody retyped them, I, I want to say, in the 60s. And you can go find a PDF version of this, and he was the Twitter of his time. Right. I mean, this is how we have such a great history in Boone County. And we've heard the name Loader here and there, but when you really read his diaries and you see that you know, Twitter today, news makes it across the world in just really an instant in 140 characters or less. I think it's what it is, 140 yeah, characters? Yeah, somewhere around there, 140, 140 yeah, updated, 145, yeah. whatever yeah, it takes. Yeah, sorry, 140, yeah. So the, uh, but Lewis Loader really kept everything under 140 characters. And he memorialized such great things as the American Civil War, President Lincoln getting shot, things happening in the distillery. I mean, who would have known that there was a that one of the original owners of the distillery, William Snyder, kept the black bear that wreaked havoc on the, on the town. And they had to shoot it one day because it, it kept biting people. A black bear is biting people, if you can even imagine that. So I can't imagine the meeting for that. We're going to have to do something about your black bear. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, fine. He just had a bad day. No, we're really going to take care of this. So, you know, Petersburg, Kentucky, it's like any good book or a movie. It has a plot and a mm-hmm. story that centers around a town, right? And then you've got to cast the characters. You've got the observer, which is Lewis Loder. He kept this great diary. And then you've got these sets of distillery owners, whether it goes from William Snyder, who was in the first set of owners, to Colonel William Appleton, his son-in-law, who was the second set of ownership, onto J.C. Jenkins and James Gaff were the third set of owners. Um, 
and then moving on to uh, Julius Freiburg and Levi Workham. Sorry, I had to look over my shoulder because I always get the. I know I've known these, known, these, known these names for a long time, but sometimes I get the first and last names yeah. mixed up. Um, but Julius Freiburg and Levi Workham. Going back on some of those people, what have I learned is that uh, William Snyder, uh, we got a phone call once. And this is the great history of Northern Kentucky. This is how people come together, and it's what I love about it. A lady by the name of Brenda Miners called me, and she was a St. Henry High School graduate, and she went to Villa College, predecessor to Thomas More when it was in Covington. And Brenda Miners is about 80 years old, and believe it or not, my father-in-law knows her. So Brenda calls up, and she lives somewhere in Texas, and the first thing you worry about when somebody calls you and says that you're talking about my great, great, great grandfather. So her grandfather times four, four yeah. generations back. And you start thinking, oh my, <laughs> what does she want? We've infringed on somebody's name. Even though we had intellectual property attorneys vet this out, yeah. it still could make it an uncomfortable conversation on the phone. So Brenda says, I want to make sure you get the story right about my grandpa. And and, and she had all the history we had and then some. Okay. So one fundamental question about this, okay, and then this is some of the great history of Boone County. Uh, in 1862, William Snyder left Boone County. And if you go back in the, in the basement of the county clerk's office, Kenny Brown's office, the county clerk, you go to the basement, go through some of those old fiscal court records, you're going to see that William Snyder's personal property was sold at the courthouse steps. Just like today when you would see a house sold on the courthouse steps, they sold his except the distillery. His son-in-law got that. And then he moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I asked Brenda, I said, Brenda, why did your grandfather move to Chattanooga? Was he embarrassed about losing everything? Or it's 1862, and Mm -hmm. we all know the Civil War started. Was he a Confederate sympathizer? And Brenda said, that's a great question. No one's ever asked that. And she said, my great-grandfather owned slaves. Now, it's a terrible thing in, in today's culture. You know, we don't, it's a piece of American history we don't want to remember, but it's still history. And Brenda said he owned slaves, and his slaves ran away from him, which is, is it, you know, is not a good thing in that day. So he probably, and she showed me a picture of his house in Chattanooga, and he moved down there with his fourth wife. So now you're kind of getting the picture. He's not a very nice guy. He's got his fourth wife. His slaves run away from him. Um, it's a Civil War starts, and he's, he's taken off south. Um, so we run into some of those things. Um, yeah, you start finding history that's uncomfortable, like you were saying, that people uncomfortable just kind of want to leave behind. Or make in, any sense. in the house he built in Chattanooga, Tennessee, was an absolutely beautiful facility, so he had plenty of money. Now, the good news is that after his son-in-law had the distillery for a couple of years, roughly from 1862 to 1865-ish, um, the two new owners came on board, and it was J.C. Jenkins and James Gaff both abolitionists, which is great news. Mm -hmm. And throughout the American Civil War, the distillery wasn't touched. They continued out. In fact, they made steamships for Union forces. And then Freiburg and Workham, when they came on a little bit later on, I mean, who would have known two Jewish guys Mm -hmm. owned the distillery in Petersburg, Kentucky. And if you know anything about whiskey history, it has a great piece of Jews and whiskey. So the Heaven Hill Distillery that's down in Bardstown, if you go in their tasting room and you look up in the lights, you're going to see a wrought iron Star David to reflect their faith. Okay. Um, and, but these guys, they, they predated all of that. And, and so that's what I love about it. If you can't tell when I talk about it, I love that piece of it. And the best part is it all predates the history of the Bardstown and Louisville distilleries, and it all happened right here in Boone County. And that's a piece of history that we're trying to bring back. You know, we're all proud of Boone County. We love Boone County. And northern Kentucky sometimes can be considered – southern ohio right right. and we in in even with even with other parts of kentucky and of course that's not the case Mm -hmm. the case is it's kentucky it has a great place in bourbon history and uh that's the story we're trying to tell yeah i always loved not love that sounds odd but i yeah tell these tell a story when we do like a a, visit other libraries throughout kentucky and people are really nice really gracious and i always make the joke slash fact that you know there's only been one governor from northern kentucky and he was assassinated before you know so before he even took office is that that mindset of how the rest of the state views us and our interplay and in kind of in, in working in that um okay so uh, going through the facility which was just amazing and then you started trying to explain the different products to me which 
none of them, none of them hooked in my memory, but um, maybe talk a little bit about that. Like that, there's a lot going on here. Very simply put, there's a lot going on. A lot of different moving parts. A lot of different um, your different your products, I guess. Of so you're waiting a number of years. So essentially, right now you're still off sourced, mm -hmm. and then in about two three years it will no longer be that way. Or is that kind of the time frame? Or is it longer? Or I'll grab bottles. You start talking. Oh. <laughs> Walk, okay. Walk yeah, the visuals are great. Sure. So to, to answer those questions, uh, we sell really three basic products. I should bring the fourth one. It's really three. So, and I'll explain them as we go along. So the first one is Boone County 1833 straight bourbon whiskey. And this is a product that was sourced from the old Seagram's facility. Today it's known as MGPI. Midwest Grain Products Incorporated. But this was made at Seagram's, which in Boone County, there's a great history with people in Boone County who worked at Seagram's their whole career. In fact, our consultant, Larry Eversold, this whiskey would have been, been made under his supervision. So this is a 12-year-old uh, uh, bourbon that we have. And this bourbon is a 21% rise, they call it in the business. So it is 75% corn, 21% rye grain, and then 4% malted barley. Um, the second set of products are the white whiskey. So the white whiskeys, um, these, this is bourbon before it goes into the barrel, okay? So what it's called on the label, we don't call it moonshine, we don't call it vodka, we don't call it white whiskey or white dog. It is called properly whiskey distilled from bourbon mash. So when the customer buys it, they know if it's moonshine, that's really just a vodka with flavoring in it. That's mm -hmm. all that that is. It's not whiskey. Uh, and the definition of whiskey has to be, uh, the product has to be made from a, 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 a grain of a fermented mash and then distilled, and then it has to be 80 proof or higher. It's the basics mm -hmm. to be a, a whiskey. Um, so that's what this is. This is all made from grain, and this particular product is 120 proof, uh, which is the proof that it goes into the barrel. So that is an aged bourbon that we make. And then the one behind it, still in the same category, but this is whiskey distilled from rye mash. Okay. Rye mash meaning that it has rye grain in it. So this one has 95% rye, 5% malted rye. And this one is, they're, they're both going to be super tasty. They're tracking very well right now at three years old apiece. Um, the rye whiskey is really going to be something special. I think everybody agrees on that. The bourbon's good too, but the rye whiskey. And the rye grain is three times more expensive Okay. Then the corn that it takes to make this. So that's a little bit more expensive of a product. And then the last one over here is a bourbon cream product. Um, the bourbon cream is simply, it's rich alabaster cream that we source from upstate New York. And then we blend it with our signature 1833 bourbon. And uh, you get this delicious product. Um, it's in an amber bottle. So it's a little bit different color of a bottle. And then on the label, we memorialize uh, Whitehall which is Lewis Loader's house, and it's still called Whitehall. It's down on the, the banks of the Ohio River uh, in Petersburg. It's a bed and breakfast today, and there's a historical sign in front of it, so we memorialize that. Uh, this is a product. Uh, people don't always know what to do with bourbon cream. So in this case, you would want to pour it over ice cream. I mean, how good is that? Put it in a root beer float, you know, something like that, or just drink it straight. Um, you know, some people want to put it in coffee. You know, I just like plain old cream in my coffee. I think you're wasting it if you put it in your coffee, but that's just my opinion. Put it over ice cream or, uh, or uh, in a root beer float. So and we've, we've discussed a lot and a lot of exciting stuff going on, um, but what do you think, and this is kind of the very, very vague question, but what do you think is next? What is, I mean, is it more? We just keep doing more, or you're like, listen, we, we got a lot here. We're really going to focus. We're going to hone down on well, this, or... Okay, so what's next? So if there's any message I want to get out before mm -hmm. I really answer that question, what's next? So, you know, we're making great whiskey. Uh, we're, we're making great whiskey. We're striving for world-class whiskey. But really, the, you know, you're all going to be the judge of that mm -hmm. in a couple of years. You're going to judge whether you like it or not. And that's the risk in this whole thing. We've put a lot of love and passion into it. In another year and a half, two years, whenever we release the bourbon at four and a half, four to, four to five years old, you'll be the judge. But I'll say this, what's next? To make this place work, it takes a lot of moving pieces like you just said. And, and really the most, valuable, the, the most valuable resource in any organization, you know, is its human resources. 
It's the most valuable resource in any organization. At the library, mm -hmm. it wouldn't work if it didn't have people to come and turn the lights on, clean the trash cans, go out and do podcasts, sales and marketing, you mm -hmm. know, all these things. So what's next? The, the first thing we want to do is continue making great whiskey. The second thing you want to do is continue to hire and retain great people. It really is. That's your most valuable resource. And I really do believe if you keep those two things in line, if you keep doing what, you, what they're doing out here every day and they're making great whiskey, you have great people, whether it's Sarah that goes out and does sales and marketing, connects with the stillers and handles everything else under the sun, or you have tour guides. If you've never been in here and you haven't seen some of the wonderful tour guides that are passionate about their jobs, you should come in and take a tour and see it. Or if you have uh, the, the people that manage the place that do some of that thankless backroom <laughs> stuff that nobody ever gets to see. Inventory. And Inventory. In this business, people ask, what's the toughest thing? It's the regulation. There are so many regulations in this. I mean, if you think that there's a lot of laws on the books, mm -hmm. just in general, Kim into the distilled spirits industry, and there is tons and tons of regulation. Every state has its own regulation, and there are 50 states, let alone all the countries for export. So what's next? The question is, um, what's next? Make great whiskey, you know, retain and hire great people. Um, and then if I had a pie-in-the-sky dream kind of a thing, for capital improvements, we would build out the, uh, the new tasting room. And that's in queue, you know, but it all takes money. It takes time. Um, that's it. Continue to build fans, loyal fans. So you like being out this spot, though. It's really kind of working for you as far as that long term for growing out um, the tasting and this, this spot. I mean, it means a lot to have it on site yeah. instead of uh, removed, that it's all here. That people Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to have it on site. You know, it's working out well for us. It's, uh, you know, in the beginning, you know, you know, I think sometimes we needed our heads examined for, for the location and you hear that from people, but it's, we were passionate about Boone County. We stayed in Boone County. We never veered from the plan, even though we knew some of the inherent risks with it. And, um, you know, and it's all paying off now, but in large part, like I said, that work doesn't, it certainly doesn't pay off from guys like me. I'm just a guy here talking on a podcast that co-founded it. It pays off people like Sarah Barnes that are out there every day doing what she does. People like uh, Jill Karst, who's the gift shop manager, Michael Thornton, um, you can name off tour, tour, tour guide extraordinaire. Um, you know, whether you're talking about the distillers, I mean, there's just a lot of people that deserve credit. And even people that don't work here anymore. They were part of it too. I love the fact that you on your tour guides have to deal with people just trying to stump them on purpose. I think that's it's like their favorite part. <laughs> I, think sure. I think that's awesome. I yeah. think that's you know it's that well and we when we do the you know go out and talk to people and even even what we do at the library, you know that that making a connection with your community and bringing people in and and how do you do that? You know how do you make people feel an ownership? And we always talk about that at work of how everyone feels they own the branch they go to is their branch. And, and that's great. I mean, that's great for us because that's what we want, that kind of connection. So I just kind of, in my mind, I imagine that you have people like that who are oh, thousands of miles away, who, but this is absolutely. like theirs. This I is, mean, you know, I have, there's people that every time we release something in the gift shop, there's a special event. Um, there's a gentleman named Sam who's in California who comes to my mind first. And he's like, I am your Boone County ambassador. And I hear from Sam every time there's something. And he finds someone in Northern Kentucky to get him a bottle or to snag him a sign something like anytime there's an event and he's not on this side of the U S so, you know, people like that are great when, right. you know, people that grew up in Petersburg come with books or things that they found, you know, we got bricks from the Aurora brick company that actually were part of the distillery before it got dismantled. The people dropped off cause they wanted us to have them and have that piece of history. You know, the, the old bottle that I was telling you guys about yes. earlier um, that, you know, fell out of somebody's wall while they were renovating, a house in Chicago. I, um, I love the fact there's a, a whiskey yeah, bottle yeah, in a wall in right? Chicago. Like, <laughs> why wouldn't there be? Yeah. That sounds like the most Chicago yeah, and thing It was in the just world. like a random, he Googled us, he found us, he emailed me and said, do you want this bottle? I'm like, yes, we absolutely do. That's amazing. And, and also what makes that story amazing to me is if, if, he'd, if he'd have fallen 10 years on either side of this or on this side of, you know, if it had been 1997, he wouldn't have found anybody. He just no. wouldn't have tossed aside. Yeah. I mean, so it's just kind of amazing that at that moment, at that time, he finds yeah, the he bottle. he decides to renovate his bathroom. It was perfect timing. <laughs> and, then, and then he sends it to you, which is even yeah. cooler yet that it just wasn't discarded. So, so people get very excited. Or did you know this about this? Or, you know, my tour guides are always reading articles and finding new stuff for us. So it's mm -hmm. really fun. Now, you touched on this a little bit earlier as far as this, this gl the global market of the bourbon industry. And it's, it's booming right now. Um, and is that... Um, I guess does it ever make you concerned or you, I mean you all seem very diversified and you're doing a lot of different things but I mean 
do, will it get to be kind of a glut of bourbon or is it just like, listen, there's such a demand out there. We can't keep up and, and things are just getting better and better. So the question would be for the, the entire bourbon industry. Yeah. Just, yeah, just globally. So for the entire bourbon industry, you know, I heard a statistic or a snippet, maybe it's probably been two, two years now, maybe that if, if, if Chinese women in Indians, the country of India, started drinking bourbon, that there wouldn't be enough. You know, there's 4 million people in Kentucky and there's 7 million whiskey barrels now. So, and you think, wow, you know, that's, yeah. hey, two barrels a piece, you know, yeah. you know, we're going to, that's, that's going to be all my tax returns this year. It's keep the money, send me the barrel of whiskey. <laughs> we'll be fine. We'll be fine. But the, uh, um, the, the fact is, is that if the global market opens up and they do say that there is, we're nowhere near the peak of bourbon popularity and in, in sales as it was in the 1970s. So there's still a lot mm-hmm. of runway ahead of us for that. So for the global market, I mean, the outlook, the outlook looks great. I just saw a, uh, an industry report two or three days ago on that. Yeah, it looks wonderful. For us personally, um, you know, we just don't have the inventory to sell that. Right. So if you're Jim Beam, that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, you, you, can, you can satisfy the global market or Brown Foreman. But if you're the Boone Canada Stilling Company, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we have enough whiskey to satisfy northern Kentuckians, we're, we're pretty Kentucky-centric. Mm-hmm. Um, we can satisfy our base here, but we don't have the product to satisfy anybody internationally. So we're happy to see that mm-hmm. because what would happen, let's say that the bourbon bubble does happen, right, and the international thing doesn't work out for anybody, well, where does all that bourbon go? It stays right here, and the prices drop, the floor drops out of them, and mm-hmm. everything gets really cheap. So there's no way that any craft distillery, whether it's us or any other craft distillery, could ever compete with, you know, a large organization. Um, in fact, for one of these large global distillers, I won't mention their name because I'm going to mention the number. I did hear for one of these large distillers, a barrel of bourbon cost them $61 to make. But if you're the Boone Canada Distilling Company, you know, if you factor in a couple of different things, it, it could be upwards of $700 a barrel. Um, it just kind of depends, but you can see the scale of economy, $60 versus 700. You can't compete with that. And, but in a way it's it's such a different product. I would assume that we're talking smaller. So it's, you know, I mean, just, I'm not saying better or worse. I'm just saying it's just, people are going to seek this out because this is a different experience. It's not the $61 barrel experience. It's, it's this experience. And I've, I've just a little bit, I know in friends of mine who are really into this. I always, I always feel like everyone always has to find this off-brand bourbon that only they drink, and mm-hmm. it's such a specific name and title. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that that's, you know, it's, you're, you just can't, just can't be maker's mark. It's going to have to be some variation. It's got to be, you know, and I kind of feel like that you're in that position is safe. And, and to me, it's interesting, too, is that, you know, it's, it's two different businesses sharing the same name because you've got a gift shop that's, it's not separate from what's going on, but it's separate. It's a different kind of entity than what than what you're doing. So it seems like, it seems like a lot. You took on like, you know, two, two, three businesses at once, you know, it's a property issue. It's a <laughs> distilling and then it's, uh, you know, the gift shop, which can be yeah. consuming. I mean, just yeah. listen to that and stuff like that. And I guess I know a little bit about kind of, a, if you equate a, a public library to a gift shop, which is not quite comparison the same, but you know, facilities, I mean, you know, you get into it and then one day your biggest concern is <laughs> the bathrooms are backing up, you know, right. like, <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's what I got in the business of, you know, that's my concern and stuff like that. So I feel like those are those kind of those unintended consequences, but that make this a great space. Well, we have two bathrooms here, so we know that <laughs> one backs up. It's a real issue. That's a real issue. <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> Things just got real. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we can go the high-end lofty talking about yeah. our goals, and now, we're, now we brought it down to that very, the, very the, basic to, level. Yeah. Answer your question about the, the bourbon, and you are right. There are two different, two different styles of making bourbon, two different you know, processes, two different types of equipment between us and, and even uh, – uh, our friends up at New Rift, they have a column still, we have a pot still. Some of the big distilleries in Louisville and Bardstown, you know, two different models. But I will say for the pot still whiskey, for the flavor profile, in a pot still, you get a fuller bodied, uh, more robust flavor. Um, that I think the customers are going to see here in about a year and a half. Uh, we've tasted it, and you really do to get a nice, robust, full flavor, um, a full palate, if you will. That's a good way to describe mm-hmm. it. So we're looking forward to it. We think, we think we're on to something pretty special. But like I said in the beginning, it's going to be up to the, the customers out there. So and that's kind of tying the more short term of, of what's next. You were explaining a little bit to me about some of the like awards and some of the things that you all have done to put, put the product out to the, to the experts out there. What are some things, I guess, that's already happened and what are some things maybe going forward um, 
before that? Sure. Um, so, I mean, like most distilleries, you know, you enter competition. So there's the San Francisco, you know, tasting awards, um, which our 12-year-old single barrel won a double gold there. So we were pretty excited about that when the single barrel program hit. Um, is really kind of when everything took off. Um, it was noticed by, you know, bourbon groups and bourbon connoisseurs and bloggers, and then the general public kind of got wind of it as well. Um, so it just kind of gave us a different different tier to be in. Um, our bourbon cream won a gold medal, and one was one of the only, you know, cream liqueurs to, to get a gold medal, which we were super proud of because there's a lot of different creams. There's a mm-hmm. lot of different cream liqueurs, bourbon creams, things of that nature. Um, we just really thought that the thought and care of putting something aged in it and not adding a lot of, you know, flavor, coloring, things of that nature. Um, we thought it would speak for itself and it did. So we're, you know, we thought it was a seasonal kind of a thing and mm-hmm. we make batches all the time. So I think everybody loves it year round. Um, Once again, what a good problem to have. Exactly. Right. We are so something. popular. Is know, like, us <laughs> out. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, these were all good things, you know, social media has been a huge help. Any kind of, you know, tastings at different bars and events that we do across the state we do distribute in a few other states and you know they've been instrumental in getting the products you know name out not just Kentucky and Ohio so it's been it's been exciting um you know there's good growth and then there's fast Mm -hmm. growth and all all good problems to have but it's just a matter of managing it and obviously we don't want to change the quality and things like that because we all hand label we all case up um, you know, when we dump barrels and bottle, it's one of the owners on the bottling line. Um, so there's a real connection a to what of, you're doing. Yeah. And there's a lot of hard work that goes into it and a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And I think people that come on a tour and they happen to catch us on bottling day, see all of our faces at bars and events and things going on and then realize, Oh wait, she is literally putting a label on there. And she was not kidding when she told us that. Yeah. So, so it gives us kind of a sense of pride, which is nice. Well, that authenticity too. Yep. People love that. You know, Absolutely. As, as we should. I mean, that's just it's cool. It's just yep. interesting to me. So, okay. Well, is there anything that you all would want to include that I, you know I haven't, I missed, I didn't t- touch on and talk about today that we could include in? So I'll plug our website. Please do. Can Your website is awesome. So Thank you, you should. It just got rebuilt. So it's, it's really I'm pretty neat. proud of it. Actually, I, it's, it's got it's got multi colors and factoids. It's stuff that There's I love. All I'm, kinds of fun things. I love all, you know kind so, of like history. So um, you can find it. our website BoonCountyDistilling.com or MadeByGhost.com. Um, Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, MadeByGhost.com. Any bar tastings, um, bar events, fall festival, any kind of information like that, we put everything that we're a part of across the state um, on our social media. So feel free to follow us and give us a like. Great. And I'll finish off by saying that when we built this distillery and the great history of it, the Boone County Public Library's website was an instrumental piece of this. That's where we went to go find pictures. We went to go find stories and history. So thank you to the Boone County Public Library for providing us with all of that information that's free for anyone to go get online. Uh, And then, too, thank you for housing the Loader Diaries in Petersburg. It's a little-known fact that not many people know about, but truly a treasure is stored down in Petersburg, Kentucky, that is in the trusting and and careful hands of the Boone County Public Library. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. really appreciate taking the time.